we are going to talk about the Jesuits, reparations, and Fabian warfare. The Jesuits, reparations, and Fabian warfare. Now, this all gets very, very interesting. And believe it or not, one has, I think, everything to do with the other. But we'll explain that as we go along. At any rate, uh, part of what inspired this show, this program, is a new story you can find on Breitbart News and elsewhere. Uh, but let's read the headline at Breitbart. It says, Georgetown students vote to pay annual slavery reparations fee. Georgetown students vote to pay annual slavery reparations fee. Now, we've often talked about Georgetown University, the influence of it. This, of course, is the Jesuit headquarters in the United States, effectively. The Jesuits for centuries have worked through schools, colleges, and universities. You've got 28 Jesuit colleges and universities here in the U.S., but they have them all over the world. And they work through the schools because they know that if they can indoctrinate and brainwash the people from an early age, then they can control them once they're older. The scripture says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The devil understands that scripture, and the Jesuits understand it, and communists and socialists and so on, because they all do the same thing. They all go after the kids from an early age to condition their thinking so that when they're older, when they become adults and so on, that's what they're going to follow. Uh, and we're going to talk about that from a couple of different perspectives. But this is what's going on. Remember, Georgetown University is a very, it's right there in Washington, D.C., right next door to Washington, D.C., and it's very, very political, always has been, is on the cutting edge of American politics. Uh, remember, at Georgetown, they predicted that the gay marriage ruling was going to be given uh, in the, the next session, the next meeting of the U.S. Supreme Court, and indeed it was. Uh, that's what happened. Uh, Georgetown University, you should definitely pay attention to what happens at Georgetown University. And when they make declarations, the professors there and things happen, etc., pay attention to that because uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say and, and we cannot say that the Jesuits control everything. We wouldn't say that because it's not logical and I think it's provably untrue. But that they have an influence, a dramatic influence on our system, that much I think can be said and is provable. It's demonstrable. And Georgetown University, stuff coming out of Georgetown, they're right now with their bridge initiative. They are teaching hardcore Islamophobia doctrine, meaning teaching, warning everybody about Islamophobia, which, of course, will be the doorway to try and bringing in Sharia law. And we're watching what's happening. Everybody just saw what happened with Judge Janine. Judge Janine uh, made some logical assertions about Ilhan Omar, the, uh, the, the Islamic representative, logical assertions about her on Fox News, and she ends up being suspended for two weeks. They crack down on her. So this is, this is serious when you've got the FBI with their Bridges program, and it's about promoting Islamophobia and trying to correct the misunderstandings about Islam and using the FBI for that purpose. It's, it's, you have to pay attention to these things because the Bible says where the enemy is concerned, where uh, the devil is concerned, and his angels, his emissaries, those who are out there doing his will, that we are not to be ignorant of the enemy's wiles. And there's no question the Jesuits have been ministers of the devil, the ministers of Satan, for centuries. And they promote all sorts of evil doctrines. And right now, there's no question that their philosophic thinking is part of what's behind this push for slavery reparations, reparations for slavery, which the Democratic Party is promoting more and more. 
And now we see the Jesuits, they are collecting money from the students there at Georgetown University to pay for reparations, for slavery reparations. Now, let's look at part of this story. It says, uh, quote, Georgetown University students voted this week in favor of a resolution that will force them to pay an annual slavery reparations fee. Students at Georgetown University passed a referendum this week that seeks to address the fact that the institution once owned slaves. In 1838, the university sold the slaves to pay off its debts. As a result of the resolution, students will now be charged an additional $27.20 per semester. The amount was chosen to represent the 272 slaves that Georgetown University sold in 1838. Over two-thirds of those who voted favored the new reparations fee. The money collected from the new student fee will go towards the creation of a fund that will be donated to schools and health care programs in Louisiana, where 4,000 known descendants of the 272 Georgetown slaves now reside. What the Jesuits are doing, I think, I think they are leading the way for a movement that is being promoted right now by the Democratic Party. And this is being done. If you read the comments online, people are just up in arms over this. And, and let, let's get something straight here. Obviously, the Jesuits themselves notice the Jesuits are not paying anything. They're not paying a reparations. They're the ones who were responsible for the slavery. But they're not paying anything. They're charging the parents of these students this fee every semester. And so people who had nothing to do with this at all are going to end up paying for it. And it would make a lot more sense if the Jesuit priests, if every Jesuit priest, if this is what they believe is a good idea, every Jesuit priest should have a certain amount of money taken out of their personal paycheck every time they get paid and put that into a fund to pay for uh, these descendants of the slaves that were once sold by Georgetown University. That would make a lot more sense because then they themselves would be directly paying this fee. But what are they doing? They're actually uh, charging students. And who's going to pay for the students? Well, the parents, obviously. Either that or it will come in the way of student loans or grants and things like that. It's, but the Jesuits themselves are not paying anything. They're not giving up anything. They're just charging people money. And then they're going to redistribute that money to these alleged descendants of, of former slaves. And that whole thing, that whole reparations argument is very, very, very controversial. Because, of course, it, the assumption there, it's, it's to blame white people in modern times for things that were done not only by whites, but by blacks and by Arabs back in the 19th century. Okay. And we've talked about this on the program before, how it was, uh, you had both white and black slave owners in America. You had over 3000 free blacks who owned slaves in early America. They owned more than they, they owned close to 13,000 slaves collectively, according to at least one report and it may, may be that they owned more than that. But there were black slave owners who owned plantations. Will anybody be seeking out the descendants of these black slave owners to hold them accountable to pay reparations for slavery? That's one of the questions. Probably not. Uh, the Muslims were very, very involved in the slave trade. They were the ones who were kidnapping the blacks in Africa and then selling them to the whites. Will they be held accountable? Probably not. It'll be interesting to see if that happens because I've never seen, I've yet to see Islam, any Islamic representative, apologize for their role in the slave trade. I've, I've yet to see that. Maybe somebody has, if they have, send me an email and show me where that is. But I've yet to see any Muslims apologize for their role in slavery, something that continues to this day. But will the Muslims be held accountable? And then what about the Democratic Party? The Democratic Party was the party of slavery. They promoted it politically in the same way 
that they promote abortion and illegal immigration today. The same thing. They were very, very dogmatic about it. They fought. Uh, they were violent at times. Uh, they were they were they were fanatics for defending slavery. There's no question about that. If you go study the history, will the Democratic Party say, OK, from now on, all registered Democrats will pay an annual fee of X number of dollars to make up for their part in the slave trade? You see, that would make a lot more sense. It doesn't make any sense at all to have Republicans who were not slave owners pay for slavery. That just doesn't make any sense at all. But another aspect of this whole thing is the whole concept of reparations for slavery, reparations for something that was practiced for thousands of years by all the nations of the earth. I mean, everyone, you know, all across Africa, uh, in parts of Europe, in China, Japan, India, your Arabian peoples, uh, Islam, 1400 years, but even before that, even before Islam, they were still practicing slavery before that. The great empires, Egypt, Babylon, Greece, Rome, all the, all the pagan empires all practiced slavery. So now to decide arbitrarily that in America somehow or other, the Americans who were responsible for bringing an end to slavery, who fought a war and declared that all men have a right to be free, that now America should pay a reparation where nobody else is paying any kind of reparation for slavery is entirely arbitrary and illogical. It's a completely illogical idea because it suggests that America was guilty of a moral wrong, which none of the other nations of the earth had ever acknowledged. You realize the only reason it's seen as being morally wrong to own slaves is because of God's law in the Old Testament and then the teachings of the New Testament. Because even under the Old Testament, you could have uh, slavery through indentured servitude, which was really a legal form of enslavement in early America. In fact, there's a very interesting article on this that I stumbled on recently. This is, you can find this at smithsonian.com. And it talks about, at least according to this article, the transition from slaves, both white and black, who were owned as indentured servitude, which had a limit to it, which I believe was seven years. That was, that's the amount. In the Bible, you have to let your indentured servants go after seven years. And I believe the same was true in early America. But this article says there was a transition. And here's the headline. You can find this on Smithsonian.com. The article is, quote, The horrible fate of John Kasor, the first black man to be declared slave for life in America. Then it says black people in early America weren't slaves. After this lawsuit, they could be. And then it talks about how something that many people are familiar with, and that is the, the first slave owner in America, a man named Anthony Johnson. Anthony Johnson, who was, and not the first slave owner, but the first registered slave owner that, that we have a record for. He, he most likely was not the first slave owner, but he was a black man named Anthony Johnson, and he owned a number of slaves. He apparently owned a number of white slaves as indentured servants, and then he owned a black slave whose name was John Kasor. And he owned him also, supposedly, as an indentured servant. But what happened was when Kasor tried to get free from Anthony Johnson, Johnson took him to court, and as a result of this lawsuit, Kasor went from being an indentured servant to a permanent slave, a lifelong slave. Okay? And that's what this article is about here at Smithsonian.com. And so, if this is correct, it was actually a black slave owner that was responsible for the idea that blacks could be permanently enslaved in America, at least according to Smithsonian.com. 
Let's go to our commercial break. Jesuits reparations and Fabian strategy. Fabian strategy. What is Fabian strategy? Well, let's go over this. Uh, if you listen to Brannon House over at Worldview Weekend, then you have probably heard Brannon talk about Fabian socialism and the Fabian socialists and this kind of thing, which actually is very, very important to understand what is going on in our country today. And this whole idea of Fabian warfare, Fabian warfare strategy, which is really what the socialists are doing in America. It's what these all these Marxists are doing, and now they've joined up with the Muslims and they're employing what are called Fabian strategies. There's a famous quote from John Adams during the uh, American Revolution where he said, quote, I am sick of Fabian systems. And we'll explain more about why he said that here as we move forward. But what are Fabian systems? What is Fabian warfare? Well, something that is often studied and something that was mentioned by our forefathers during the American Revolution is the fall of Carthage, the destruction of the ancient Carthaginians by ancient Rome, old pagan Rome. And you have the three Punic Wars, and probably the most famous of them was with Hannibal, Hannibal Barca, the great Carthaginian general who brought his troops over the Alps with the elephants and so on. And he, he did so so he could lead this surprise attack against Rome. Hannibal was a brilliant general. He's one of the greatest generals in history, studied in uh, military colleges and so on uh, because of his battle tactics and what he did and won a number of famous battles, probably the most famous of which was the Battle of Cannae, where he just destroyed, it is said, more than 50,000 Roman soldiers in a single day, just annihilated them. And what happened was, the Roman armies could not figure out how to defeat Hannibal on the battlefield. Whenever they faced him, he completely destroyed them and demoralized them. So the Roman leaders appointed a guy named Quintus Fabius Maximus Vericosus, and he becomes the leader of the Roman Republic. And they chose him because they wanted him to deal with Hannibal during the Second Punic War. So he recognized that Rome could not figure out how to beat Hannibal on the battlefield. And every time they lost one of these big battles, it was just humiliating for them. So he developed these indirect methods of warfare. And he was nicknamed the Delayer because what he was doing is he was kind of going around Hannibal and he was delaying any kind of direct conflict with him using a system of avoidance where what they would do is look for the weaknesses in Carthage. They actually started, Rome actually started attacking Carthaginian towns and cities and things like that where they did not have strong defenses. Okay. And that ultimately caused the Carthaginian leaders to recall Hannibal back from Rome and they said, you can't keep attacking Rome. You have to come back now and defend our cities. And that ultimately led to Hannibal's downfall at the Battle of Zama. That's where he's ultimately defeated by Rome in battle. But what happened was Quintus Fabius, he initiated this whole process of avoidance and delaying the direct conflict until you could figure out how to beat this guy. Don't go and fight him on the open field of battle, because right now he knows how to win. He's too strong and we don't know how to beat him. And so this became the Fabian warfare strategy. And it is a strategy that's been employed historically again and again, actually with, with great success in some cases. The American Revolution is an example because George Washington, when he was fighting against the British, the colonists could not stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with British regulars because they were too strong. So Washington developed these indirect methods where they're hiding, they're retreating, they're pulling back, they're doing hit-and-run type operations and then pulling away. And that's what inspired Adams at one point to say that he was 
uh, sick of these Fabian systems. But then he goes on to say it may be that General Washington knows what he's doing. And, of course, Washington did know what he was doing uh, because he waited until he found the right opportunity. And then he attacked the British and defeated them famously and won the war. But the Fabian warfare methods, these are the methods that have been employed and are being employed by Jesuits, socialists, and now your politicized Muslims here in the United States. They're using indirect methods of attacking and weakening the United States culturally, politically, and through our education systems. And I believe this next push, because one of their key weapons is racial agitation, to, to stir up as much discord and hatred and division on the issue of race as they possibly can. And they know that calling for reparations, to, to pay a reparation to the descendants of the former slaves and this kind of thing, they know that that is going to provoke discord and conflict and everything else. They know it, and that's what they want. But now I want to read, as we're winding down here, I want to read this quote, this warning from a 19th century Catholic priest, Charles Chiniqui, the close friend of Abraham Lincoln, who wrote his book, 50 Years in the Church of Rome. Chiniqui eventually became a Protestant, but here is what he says about Rome, the Jesuits, and education. He said this, he said, quote, you all know that it is the avowed desire of Rome to have public education in the hands of the Jesuits. She says so everywhere that they are the best, the model teachers. Why so? Because they more boldly and more successfully than any other of her teachers aim at the destruction of the intelligence and conscience of their pupils. When a man has been trained a sufficient time by them, he most perfectly becomes a moral corpse. Well, that's basically what's happening in our education system. The minds and the intelligence of our young people is being ruined by all of this perverse teaching and absurd upside-down ideology. And now it's being driven to the point where our young people are being convinced through lies and propaganda that they need to pay a reparation for the sins of the past. When in fact, the reality is that America is the great champion of freedom. And the reason why blacks and so many others have freedom in the modern world is because of the valiant courage and the valiant fight for freedom that America stood for from the beginning. America is not the author of slavery. America is the great defender of liberty. All right, brethren, we are out of time. We are going to talk about the Jesuits, reparations, and Fabian warfare. The Jesuits, reparations, and Fabian warfare. Now, this all gets very, very interesting. And believe it or not, one has, I think, everything to do with the other, but we'll explain that as we go along. At any rate, uh, part of what inspired this show, this program, is a new story you can find on Breitbart News and elsewhere. Uh, but let's read the headline at Breitbart. It says, Georgetown students vote to pay annual slavery reparations fee. Georgetown students vote to pay annual slavery reparations fee. Now, we've often talked about Georgetown University, the influence of it. This, of course, is the Jesuit headquarters in the United States, effectively. The Jesuits for centuries have worked through schools, colleges, and universities. You've got 28 Jesuit colleges and universities here in the U.S., but they have them all over the world. And they work through the schools because they know that if they can indoctrinate and brainwash the people from an early age, then they can control them once they're older. The scripture says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. 
The devil understands that scripture, and the Jesuits understand it, and communists and socialists and so on, because they all do the same thing. They all go after the kids from an early age to condition their thinking so that when they're older, when they become adults and so on, that's what they're going to follow. Uh, And we're going to talk about that from a couple of different perspectives. But this is what's going on. Remember, Georgetown University is a very, it's right there in Washington, D.C., right next door to Washington, D.C., and it's very, very political, always has been, is on the cutting edge of American politics. Uh, Remember, at Georgetown, they predicted that the gay marriage ruling was going to be given uh, in the, the next session, the next meeting of the U.S. Supreme Court, and indeed it was. Uh, that's what happened. Uh, Georgetown University, you should definitely pay attention to what happens at Georgetown University. And when they make declarations, the professors there and things happen, etc., pay attention to that because uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say, and, and we cannot say, that the Jesuits control everything. We wouldn't say that because it's not logical and I think it's provably untrue. But that they have an influence, a dramatic influence on our system, that much I think can be said and is provable. It's demonstrable. And Georgetown University, stuff coming out of Georgetown, they're right now with their bridge initiative, they are teaching hardcore Islamophobia doctrine meaning teaching, warning everybody about Islamophobia, which, of course, will be the doorway to try and bringing in Sharia law. And we're watching what's happening. Everybody just saw what happened with Judge Janine. Judge Janine uh, made some logical assertions about Ilhan Omar, the, uh, the, the Islamic representative, Logical assertions about her on Fox News, and she ends up being suspended for two weeks. They crack down on her. So this is this is serious when you've got the FBI with their Bridges program, and it's about promoting Islamophobia and trying to correct the misunderstandings about Islam and using the FBI for that purpose. It's, it's, you have to pay attention to these things because the Bible says where the enemy is concerned, where uh, the devil is concerned, and his angels, his emissaries, those who are out there doing his will, that we are not to be ignorant of the enemy's wiles. And there's no question the Jesuits have been ministers of the devil, the ministers of Satan, for centuries. And they promote all sorts of evil doctrines. And right now, there's no question that their philosophic thinking is part of what's behind this push for slavery reparations, reparations for slavery, which the Democratic Party is promoting more and more. And now we see the Jesuits, they are collecting money from the students there at Georgetown University to pay for reparations, for slavery reparations. Now, let's look at part of this story. It says, uh, quote, Georgetown University students voted this week in favor of a resolution that will force them to pay an annual slavery reparations fee. Students at Georgetown University passed a referendum this week that seeks to address the fact that the institution once owned slaves. In 1838, the university sold the slaves to pay off its debts. As a result of the resolution, students will now be charged an additional $27.20 per semester. The amount was chosen to represent the 272 slaves that Georgetown University sold in 1838. Over two-thirds of those who voted favored the new reparations fee. The money collected from the new student fee will go towards the creation of a fund that will be donated to schools and health care programs in Louisiana, where 4,000 known descendants of the 272 Georgetown slaves now reside. What the Jesuits are doing, I think, I think they are leading the way for a movement that is being promoted right now by the Democratic Party. And this is being done, if you read the comments online, 
people are just up in arms over this. And and let, let's get something straight here. Obviously, the Jesuits themselves notice the Jesuits are not paying anything. They're not paying a reparations. They're the ones who were responsible for the slavery. But they're not paying anything. They're charging the parents of these students this fee every semester. And so people who had nothing to do with this at all are going to end up paying for it. And it would make a lot more sense if the Jesuit priests, if every Jesuit priest, if this is what they believe is a good idea, every Jesuit priest should have a certain amount of money taken out of their personal paycheck every time they get paid and put that into a fund to pay for uh, these descendants of the slaves that were once sold by Georgetown University. That would make a lot more sense because then they themselves would be directly paying this fee. But what are they doing? They're actually uh, charging students. And who's going to pay for the students? Well, the parents, obviously. Either that or it will come in the way of student loans or grants and things like that. It's But the Jesuits themselves are not paying anything. They're not giving up anything. They're just charging people money. And then they're going to redistribute that money to these alleged descendants of, of former slaves. And that whole thing, that whole reparations argument is very, very, very controversial. Because, of course, it, the assumption there, it's, it's to blame white people in modern times for things that were done not only by whites, but by blacks and by Arabs back in the 19th century. Okay, and we've talked about this on the program before, how it was, uh, you had both white and black slave owners in America. You had over 3,000 free blacks who owned slaves in early America. They owned more than, they, they owned close to 13,000 slaves collectively, according to at least one report. And it may, may be that they owned more than that. But there were black slave owners who owned plantations. Will anybody be seeking out the descendants of these black slave owners to hold them accountable to pay reparations for slavery? That's one of the questions. Probably not. Uh, the Muslims were very, very involved in the slave trade. They were the ones who were kidnapping the blacks in Africa and then selling them to the whites. Will they be held accountable? Probably not. It'll be interesting to see if that happens because I've never seen, I've yet to see Islam, any Islamic representative, apologize for their role in the slave trade. I've, I've yet to see that. Maybe somebody has, if they have, send me an email and show me where that is. But I've yet to see any Muslims apologize for their role in slavery, something that continues to this day. But will the Muslims be held accountable? And then what about the Democratic Party? The Democratic Party was the party of slavery. They promoted it politically in the same way that they promote abortion and illegal immigration today. The same thing. They were very, very dogmatic about it. They fought. Uh, they were violent at times. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were fanatics for defending slavery. There's no question about that. If you go study the history, will the Democratic Party say, okay, from now on, all registered Democrats will pay an annual fee of X number of dollars to make up for their part in the slave trade? You see, that would make a lot more sense. It doesn't make any sense at all to have Republicans who were not slave owners pay for slavery. That just doesn't make any sense at all. But another aspect of this whole thing is the whole concept of reparations for slavery, reparations for something that was practiced for thousands of years by all the nations of the earth. I mean, everyone, you know, all across Africa, uh, in parts of Europe, in China, Japan, India, your Arabian peoples, uh, Islam, 1400 years, but even before that, even before Islam, they were still practicing slavery before that. The great empires, Egypt, Babylon, Greece, Rome, all the, all the pagan empires all practiced slavery. So now to decide arbitrarily that in America somehow or other, 
the Americans who were responsible for bringing an end to slavery, who fought a war and declared that all men have a right to be free, that now America should pay a reparation where nobody else is paying any kind of reparation for slavery is entirely arbitrary and illogical. It's a completely illogical idea because it suggests that America was guilty of a moral wrong, which none of the other nations of the earth had ever acknowledged. You realize the only reason it's seen as being morally wrong to own slaves is because of God's law in the Old Testament and then the teachings of the New Testament. Because even under the Old Testament, you could have uh, slavery through indentured servitude, which was really a legal form of enslavement in early America. In fact, there's a very interesting article on this that I stumbled on recently. This is You can find this at smithsonian.com. And it talks about, at least according to this article, the transition from slaves, both white and black, who were owned as indentured servitude which had a limit to it which i believe was seven years that was that's the amount in the bible you have to let your indentured servants go after seven years and i believe the same was true in early america but this article says there was a transition and here's the headline you can find this on smithsonian.com the article is quote the horrible fate of john casor the first black man to be declared slave for life in America. Then it says black people in early America weren't slaves. After this lawsuit, they could be. And then it talks about how something that many people are familiar with, and that is the, the first slave owner in America, a man named Anthony Johnson. Anthony Johnson, who was, and not the first slave owner, but the first registered slave owner that, that we have a record for. He, he most likely was not the first slave owner, but he was a black man named Anthony Johnson, and he owned a number of slaves. He apparently owned a number of white slaves as indentured servants, and then he owned a black slave whose name was John Casor. And he owned him also, supposedly, as an indentured servant. But what happened was when Kasor tried to get free from Anthony Johnson, Johnson took him to court. And as a result of this lawsuit, Kasor went from being an indentured servant to a permanent slave, a lifelong slave. Okay. And that's what this article is about here at smithsonian.com. And so if this is correct, it was actually a black slave owner that was responsible for the idea that blacks could be permanently enslaved in America, at least according to Smithsonian.com. Let's go to our commercial break. Jesuits reparations and Fabian strategy, Fabian strategy. What is Fabian strategy? Well, let's go over this. Uh, if you listen to Brannon House over at Worldview Weekend, then you have probably heard Brannon talk about Fabian socialism and the Fabian socialists and this kind of thing, which actually is very, very important to understand what is going on in our country today. And this whole idea of Fabian warfare, Fabian warfare strategy, which is really what the socialists are doing in America. It's what these, all these Marxists are doing, and now they've joined up with the Muslims, and they're employing what are called Fabian strategies. There's a famous quote from John Adams during the uh, American Revolution, where he said, quote, I am sick of Fabian systems. And we'll explain more about why he said that here as we move forward. But what are Fabian systems? What is Fabian warfare? Well, something that is often studied and something that was mentioned by our forefathers during the American Revolution is the fall of Carthage, the destruction of the ancient Carthaginians by ancient Rome, old pagan Rome. And you have the three Punic Wars, and probably the most famous of them was with Hannibal, 
Hannibal Barca, the great Carthaginian general who brought his troops over the Alps with the elephants and so on. And he, he did so so he could lead this surprise attack against Rome. Hannibal was a brilliant general. He's one of the greatest generals in history, studied in uh, military colleges and so on uh, because of his battle tactics and what he did and won a number of famous battles, probably the most famous of which was the Battle of Cannae, where he just destroyed, it is said, more than 50,000 Roman soldiers in a single day, just annihilated them. And what happened was the Roman armies could not figure out how to defeat Hannibal on the battlefield. Whenever they faced him, he completely destroyed them and demoralized them. So the Roman leaders appointed a guy named Quintus Fabius Maximus Vericosus, and he becomes the leader of the Roman Republic. And they chose him because they wanted him to deal with Hannibal during the Second Punic War. So he recognized that Rome could not figure out how to beat Hannibal on the battlefield. And every time they lost one of these big battles, it was just humiliating for them. So he developed these indirect methods of warfare. And he was nicknamed the Delayer because what he was doing is he was kind of going around Hannibal and he was delaying any kind of direct conflict with him using a system of avoidance where what they would do is look for the weaknesses in Carthage. They actually started, Rome actually started attacking Carthaginian towns and cities and things like that where they did not have strong defenses. Okay, and that ultimately caused the Carthaginian leaders to recall Hannibal back from Rome. And they said, you can't keep attacking Rome. You have to come back now and defend our cities. And that ultimately led to Hannibal's downfall at the Battle of Zama. That's where he's ultimately defeated by Rome in battle. But what happened was Quintus Fabius, he initiated this whole process of avoidance and delaying the direct conflict until you could figure out how to beat this guy. Don't go and fight him on the open field of battle because right now he knows how to win. He's too strong and we don't know how to beat him. And so this became the Fabian warfare strategy. And it is a strategy that's been employed historically again and again, actually with, with great success in some cases. The American Revolution is an example because George Washington, when he was fighting against the British, the colonists could not stand toe to toe with British regulars because they were too strong. So Washington developed these indirect methods where they're hiding, they're retreating, they're pulling back, they're doing hit and run type operations and then pulling away. And that's what inspired Adams at one point to say that he was uh, sick of these Fabian systems. But then he goes on to say it may be that General Washington knows what he's doing. And of course, Washington did know what he was doing uh, because he waited until he found the right opportunity. And then he attacked the British and defeated them famously and won the war. But the Fabian warfare methods, these are the methods that have been employed and are being employed by Jesuits, socialists, and now your politicized Muslims here in the United States. They're using indirect methods of attacking and weakening the United States culturally, politically, and through our education systems. And I believe this next push, because one of their key weapons is racial agitation, to, to stir up as much discord and hatred and division on the issue of race as they possibly can. And they know that calling for reparations, to, to pay a reparation to the descendants of the former slaves and this kind of thing, they know that that is going to provoke discord and conflict and everything else. They know it, and that's what they want. But now I want to read, as we're winding down here, I want to read this quote, this warning 
from a 19th century Catholic priest, Charles Chinoquy, the close friend of Abraham Lincoln, who wrote his book, 50 Years in the Church of Rome. Chinoquy eventually became a Protestant, but here is what he says about Rome, the Jesuits, and education. He said this, he said, quote, You all know that it is the avowed desire of Rome to have public education in the hands of the Jesuits. She says so everywhere that they are the best, the model teachers. Why so? Because they more boldly and more successfully than any other of her teachers aim at the destruction of the intelligence and conscience of their pupils. When a man has been trained a sufficient time by them, he most perfectly becomes a moral corpse. Well, that's basically what's happening in our education system. The minds and the intelligence of our young people is being ruined by all of this perverse teaching and absurd upside-down ideology. And now it's being driven to the point where our young people are being convinced through lies and propaganda that they need to pay a reparation for the sins of the past. When in fact, the reality is that America is the great champion of freedom and the reason why blacks and so many others have freedom in the modern world is because of the valiant courage and the valiant fight for freedom that America stood for from the beginning. America is not the author of slavery. America is the great defender of liberty. All right, brethren, we are out of time about the Jesuits openly promoting, openly promoting witchcraft and homosexuality at the Vatican's Jesuit University in Rome. Openly promoting now witchcraft and homosexuality. We've talked about this on the program before. All the elements are there. They've been there really for centuries. But now we've got an article on LifeSite news.com which is a catholic website an obviously very conservative catholic website uh, but this is what they report uh, vatican's jesuit university in rome hosts anti-catholic exhibit featuring homosexual couple witch meaning homosexual couple and a witch literally a woman who is involved in witchcraft and the way that they pre uh, present it, if you study this article, they are promoting in a, in a sort of subtle way, they are promoting witchcraft. They are promoting homosexuality. And uh, the article says, uh, quote, a new photo exhibit on atheism and unbelief featuring a homosexual couple, a transhumanist and a witch who advocates human extinction opened today in the main atrium of the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. Now, that is the Jesuit University, the Pontifical Gregorian University. And it goes on to say, the Jesuit-run Pontifical University has in recent years been the site of key events, including a secret meeting that sought to sway the 2015 Family Synod to accept same-sex unions and a public lecture by the by then newly appointed Pontifical Academy for Life member uh, Maurizio Chiodi, etc. A secret meeting that sought to sway the 2015 Family Synod to accept same-sex unions. Of course, uh, thankfully, there are still many conservatives in the Catholic Church and leadership and so on who are not willing to go along with this. But this is something that I talked about when Pope Francis, the first Jesuit pope, was elected, that it will not surprise me at all if, while he is in the Vatican, there is a push for the Catholic Church to officially accept gay marriage. That will not surprise me. Uh, here in America, we got some disappointing news. Uh, President Trump is promoting uh, Gay Pride Month, which apparently is the month of June. Uh, he's sent out a message in support of that. We, we do not agree with that. It's unfortunate. 
uh, our, our view of President Trump in that regard is, you know, Trump is better than Hillary. Better than Hil- Hillary not only would have promoted it, but then she would have undoubtedly supported the prosecution of Christians uh, to make gay wedding cakes and all the rest of it. I think that what evangelicals can expect from President Trump is that while he's going to do things like this that we do not agree with, nevertheless, uh, he has, at least so far, uh, his administration has helped to protect Christians from being prosecuted and dragged into court and this kind of thing in violation of religious liberty and freedom and so on. It's, I mean, it's, it is the unfortunate predicament that our country is in, that the leaders that we have to choose, we have to choose leaders in, in sort of a tactical kind of way to figure out which leader is going to protect the most amount of freedom from one administration to the next. Uh, I think Hillary would have pushed us down a hard path towards socialism very, very quickly. And the situation would have been far worse. Now we have an out and proud homosexual running for president. This Mayor Buttigieg, or Buttigieg, or however they pronounce his name, uh, who is allegedly married to another guy. And if he were to win the presidency, we would have a homosexual couple in the White House. I mean, it's, it's just, it's unthinkable. It's unthinkable. None of our forefathers would ever have accepted anything like this. None of them would have, would have accepted the interpretation of the Constitution that allows this kind of thing to be promoted. None of them. They certainly never would have accepted in the late 19th century that this is somehow or other supported by the 14th Amendment, which is what they used to justify a gay marriage. Nobody, nobody who wrote the 14th Amendment, nobody who signed it, nobody who supported it for the first hundred years of its existence would ever have agreed that it somehow or other supported gay marriage. But that, unfortunately, is where we are with our system. The system has become so corrupted, so perverse. Uh, judicial activism has turned the Constitution upside down and the Democratic Party want to make it worse and worse. And so they're not willing to obey the rule of law, unfortunately. Uh, So we've got to be in prayer for our country because this situation will only get worse, especially if Trump were not reelected in 2020. It kind of looks like he will be. It looks like he will be. Uh, Trump has done some things. He has suppressed the advance of the gay movement into the military. He's not allowing transgenders to serve. I was glad to see that they pushed back on that issue and just said, no, we're, we're not going to have transgenders in the military. That's it. And if you study the, the dialogue on it, it's a little bit more complex. They allowed the transgenders who were, who were let in by the Obama administration in 2016, they allowed them to be grandfathered in, but they're not allowing any new transgenders to enter into the U.S. military. They're not allowing people to transition while they're in the military, uh, you know, to, to change their orientation, as it were. And people who have undergone some kind of a transition from a woman to a man or a man to a woman uh, cannot join the military at this point. That's what the Trump administration has done, which I think is a is a positive thing. It's a step in the right direction. Really, they should not allow gays in the military at all. Uh, It's contrary to the tradition of our forefathers. George Washington would never have permitted it. In fact, when he found a homosexual in the military, in the Continental Army, who tried to violate another soldier, Washington had him drummed out of the military. Our military from the beginning was always a Christian military based on a Christian code of conduct. You weren't even allowed to curse and swear. This is back when our military was undefeated. Their traditions were inherited from the Puritans who came before them. They would never have allowed this. They recognize that if if an army is going to be successful in battle, they must have the blessing of the Lord. 
As the scripture says, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but safety or victory comes from the Lord. And so all of our forefathers would have said, if you want the approval of God, when you go into battle and you go to fight your enemies, you need to obey the commandments of God, the word of God. You can't be promoting things that are an open violation of God's law. God says, he who honors me, him shall I honor. And our forefathers believe that God is the God of armies. That, you know, as, uh, as Cromwell was famous for saying, uh, trust in the Lord and keep your powder dry. In other words, yes, you, you prepare yourself for every situation as much as you can. And you trust in the Lord. You know, you don't trust in yourself because your preparation, whatever it is, and your training and that kind of thing by itself is not going to gain you the victory. Look at what happened to us in Vietnam. We were the most powerful military in the world. We're fighting a bunch of uh, uh, farmers who live in huts, and we could not win that war because of all the confusion that went on. We couldn't win the war. We ended up losing and backing out of there and everything else. It was a nightmare, as it was called by President Ford afterwards. So for our military to be departing from the Christian standard that it was based upon, and yes, it was founded on a Christian standard originally, to depart from that, I believe, is why we haven't really been able to fully and completely win a conflict on the world stage since the end of World War II. And I think our forefathers would agree to that. But anyway, back to this situation with the Jesuits in Rome. They play no small part in the advancing of homosexuality. In fact, you've got the Jesuit uh, James Martin, who's talked about this, written about it. Uh, he's got the book, which you can find online, Building a Bridge how the Catholic Church and the LGBT community can enter into a relationship of respect, compassion, and sensitivity. If you go watch his video on this, he talks about how it's time, supposedly, to move from tolerating gays in the church to embracing them, basically openly affirming homosexual practices. And the Jesuits have been in cooperation with this. I can't. I could not prove that they're behind the whole thing. I, I can trace it back to Kinsey in our country, Alfred Kinsey. That's why we made the film The Kinsey Syndrome. But you can look at uh, people like the Jesuit John McNeil and his book on the church and the homosexual. He was one of the, I mean, he, he may have been the first in the Catholic church uh, and maybe in any church. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know of anyone earlier than him that was promoting the idea that the churches, that Christianity in any form, whether Catholic, Protestant, Greek, Russian, Orthodox, etc., should now start to embrace homosexuality as normal and acceptable behavior. But there's no question that the Jesuits have been behind doing this for decades now. Decades. They've pushed it and promoted it, etc. And you've got more and more so-called professing Christian groups that are embracing the idea and normalizing it more and more. And it's unfortunate because we are warned in the scripture, we're warned, for example, in the book of Jude. I mean, you know, we have the warning from the Lord Jesus Christ that as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And we have in the epistle of Jude, Jude verse 7, where he says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, meaning sexual immorality, and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And then in verse 8, he's warning about false teachers, Jude is, and he says, likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. And then he goes, skipping down to verse 11, he's still talking about the false teachers. He says, woe unto them, 
For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gain saying of Korah. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Twice dead, a reference to the second death. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. That's the warning we have in the book of Jude. All right, we are going to how the Jesuits are now openly promoting homosexuality and witchcraft in Rome. Openly promoting homosexuality and witchcraft. And I should say this, uh, this presentation that they have at the uh, Gregorian University in Rome, the students, a number of them who are at the university there, who are presumably Catholic, have spoken out against this whole thing. They, they, they recognize the evil of it. In fact, if you read through this article, they show you the examples of what they are doing, what they're promoting and so on. Uh, I mean, I mean, they're, they're, they're promoting, for example, they have an, and it's a series of photographs and exhibits where they're talking about unbelievers, but they're not condemning unbelief. They're not speaking against it. It's as if they're trying to normalize it. And so they show, for example, one girl in wearing a, a from, she looks Scandinavian and uh, Hedda Freeland, it says, is a member of the humanist youth group in Norway. And uh, they have a quote from her. Uh, she says, when I was a child, I believed in God and prayed to him. But then there came a time when I needed proof. My belief faded and I became more realistic. Then the article goes on to say, it says, quote, like most people in the area, uh, Hedda's parents and older sister had Christian confirmations. Then she says, quote, I'm very grateful that I chose another way and stood by it because it changed my view of the world into a better one. In other words, she's glad that she chose to abandon Christianity in favor of humanism because it's a better worldview. And now, and now of course, they're not speaking against this. They're just, it's almost like they're promoting it. And uh, the article says, quote, the whole exhibit is displayed before the large statue of the Lord. There's a big statue of Jesus. And it says prominently located in the atrium of the Pontifical University. At the statue's base is etched the inscription, go teach all nations. Behold, I am with you. Now, this is one of those moments where it's useful, I think, and important to actually look at the full context of what Jesus says there in Matthew chapter 28, because that's what they're referring to. And beginning in verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So notice we're commanded as believers to go and teach all things whatsoever Jesus commanded, not to go around teaching homosexuality and witchcraft and humanism and unbelief. That's not what we're called to do. And so, I mean, but there's many examples, if you study the history of the Jesuits, where they do things like that, where they'll edit out, they'll edit around what the scripture says, they'll quote things out of their full context. Like, for example, uh, there's a historic quote where they quote uh, from the book of Hebrews, where it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Uh, but they use that to support murder and assassination uh, in the Jesuit order. 
at least according to one historic account. And apart from the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And they apply that then to assassination and murder. And I think that may be found in the Jesuit oath, if I remember correctly. Anyway, uh, this uh, ta- it says the exhibit was organized to coincide with a major atheism conference on cultures of unbelief taking place at the Gregorian University. It goes on to say, according to organizers, the event marks the 50th anniversary of the Vatican's own Culture of Unbelief Conference in March 1969. So they've been hosting this Culture of Unbelief since the year 1969. Incredible. Uh, now, bear bear in mind, this is, this is all part of, in part, they, they study atheism. And, and, you know, you hear they say, oh, they're stu- are they studying atheists to try and convert them to biblical Christianity? Well, no, uh, not at all. And now, now you've got this Jesuit pope who's made statements to the effect, giving the impression that atheists go to heaven. Now, it is worth noting that there are Catholics there at the university who recognize that this whole thing is very subversive. Uh, they quote an anonymous priest in the article who said that this was essentially cultural Marxism. And then at the very end of the article here at LifeSite News, it says, quote, according to sources at the university today, one student put in the comment box, quote, satanic. So they recognize that the exhibit there is satanic. Now, I point that out because I don't want you to think that this is my impression of what they're doing as though they're just exploring different cultures or something. No, the impression that the exhibit gives is that they are promoting homosexuality. They are promoting witchcraft. They are promoting the, this humanist youth society where they're celebrating a girl who decided to leave Christianity, to abandon her Christian family and choose a quote unquote better way, which is unbelief. Why would anybody who's interested in promoting Christianity or the Great Commission or any of that want to celebrate these things or to, you know, give them a a platform? It makes no sense whatsoever unless you understand the Jesuits. And of course, this is what the Jesuits have been known for throughout their history. Uh, This is why they were driven out of countries in Europe over and over again. Uh, because they were known for getting involved in paganism and witchcraft. You know, the presence of having a witch there and to be promoting a witch. It reminds me of the book Witches and Jesuits that you can find online. I've talked about it before, but it's an assertion. The, The book itself is research done by an author who believes that the play Macbeth Shakespeare's Macbeth was written as an indictment against the Jesuits, who most everybody in England at the time believed were behind the gunpowder plot of 1605, the plot to blow up Parliament and kill the king, King James I. It was generally accepted that the Jesuits were behind this whole thing, and so Macbeth was seen as one of the powder plays, as they called them, and is said to have been an indictment of the Jesuits as witches, Satanists, and murderers. That's supposedly why the play was written. The author, but the author, Gary Wills, was a Pulitzer Prize winning author. So, and then we think about Mystery Babylon and the cup full of her abominations. What does the Bible tell us about homosexuality and so on? that it is an abomination unto God. And that's what we find Rome and her Jesuit priests promoting even to this day. We believe Bible prophecy is coming to pass before our eyes, brethren. And so we need to to look to the sure word of prophecy, look to the word of God, continue in prayer for our country and for all sincere believers in the Lord Jesus Christ Uh, as these times become more and more difficult in which we live. Nazis and the Green New Deal. 
the Nazis and the Green New Deal. You know, we might have even called this show Nazis, Jesuits, and the Green New Deal because they all seem to be intertwined at this point. Now, part of the reason we're doing this particular program is because of a recent announcement here from New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, who has announced that the city of New York is going to ban glass and steel. This is part of New York City's own Green New Deal. And you can find this video online where Bill de Blasio is standing there and there's all these people holding up green signs that say New York City Green New Deal, etc. So whether Congress has acted upon this or not, and Congress has, has just shut the thing down and denounced it, the Republicans have denounced it as completely absurd. As we talked about before, though, it's important to remember that the Green New Deal is said by the Jesuits in their own publication at America Magazine that this is in agreement with the Pope's environmental encyclical, uh, Laudato Si, Pope Francis 2015 encyclical. Remember, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, had written an article for America Magazine, which is the Jesuit publication, before she was elected. So her relationship with the Jesuit order was established before she was elected to office. That's worth considering. And uh, so they have their uh, article on America the Jesuit Review back in February of this year, which says the editors, the Green New Deal should be improved not mocked. So that is their position. Uh, you can even go to the Georgetown University website or go to Georgetown Law. Georgetown Law has the Georgetown Environmental Law Review. Georgetown Environmental Law Review at georgetown.edu and Back in March of this year, an article called The Art of the Green New Deal. And again, talking about the whole Green New Deal uh, on Capitol Hill, etc., and its proposal by AOC, what it could mean, and, and then they just give a whole breakdown of it. But basically, their summation of it is that it represents an outline for a future rather than a specific piece of legislation. So now what we're seeing is we're seeing Democrats like de Blasio take action at a state level. Well, let's listen to some of what Bill de Blasio said on this whole thing. This is, uh, this is very, very interesting. Listen to what he says. Today we announced the New York City Green New Deal. We're going to ban the classic glass and steel skyscraper, but we're not going to allow what we used to see in the past. People are dying. We are dying. The yays are zero. The nays are 57. We're actually making the Green New Deal come alive here in New York City. So we have our own Green New Deal. We're going to ban the classic glass and steel skyscrapers, which are incredibly inefficient. If someone wants to build one of those things, they can take a whole lot of steps to make it energy efficient, but we're not going to allow what we used to see in the past. They have no place in our city or in our earth anymore. We're putting clear, strong mandates, the first of any major city on the earth, to say to building owners, you got to clean up your act, you got to retrofit, you got to save energy. If you don't do it by 2030, there will be serious fines as high as a million dollars or more for the biggest buildings. These are now the toughest laws of any state or city in the nation. And we've only just begun. So let's stop there. So that's that's really an overview of what Bill de Blasio and the radical leftists in New York, what they've come up with. He's saying this, these are the toughest legislation and we've only just begun. Anybody who looks at the outline for the Green New Deal recognizes that this is not about the environment at all. This is about fascist totalitarian control over virtually every area of society. When they're talking about rebuilding all of the buildings in our country, I mean, you got to be kidding me. To do that would cost an absolute fortune, more money than 
you know, it, this country is going to generate probably in the next several hundred years. Uh, that's for a second, but then you'd have to take control of every area of society to get it done, and that is exactly what they want. This mantra that they're uh, pounding, saying, you know, we've got 12 years or we're all going to be destroyed. In fact, uh, this is what Bill de Blasio starts out by saying, listen. We have only 12 years to get it right, or our lives just won't be the same. Okay, so he is repeating the, the, the declaration of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Okay, and now we're seeing what happens. Now this becomes law. If you watch this video, this particular video that was uh, created, they've got some comical music in the background showing these different clips because the whole thing is really kind of silly. There's no question that there is a comical aspect to it, but it takes a very dark turn once we look at the history of environmentalism, once we look at the history of this going back to the Nazis during World War II, which is what we're going to talk about on the show today. But before we get to that, I want to play the last part of this series of video clips with Bill de Blasio and all of his commentary on this, because right toward the end, he's being interviewed by a journalist, and the journalist thankfully confronts him over his absurd uh, hypocrisy, the fact that he has a car come and drive him to the gym so that he can go and, and work out, and he goes all the way across town rather than use a gym there in his neighborhood where he lives. Uh, but he confronts Bill de Blasio, and you have to hear his response because it's very important. Listen. You live on the Upper East Side in Gracie Mansion. Uh, most days, or several days a week, a city uh, SUV drives you 11 miles to a gym in Brooklyn, as opposed to one that's close to where you currently reside. Uh, what sort of environmentally responsible example are you setting there, taking this drive in a car, as opposed to going someplace nearby? So let's be clear, this is just part of my life. I, I come from that neighborhood in Brooklyn. Uh, that's my home. I go there on a regular basis to stay connected to where I come from uh, and not be in the bubble that I think for a lot of politicians is a huge problem. Uh, but the fact is that those cars and that security detail are part of the life of being mayor of New York City. All right, now first, let's, let's bear something in mind. If you've never lived in or visited New York City or traveled much there, 11 miles in New York City, in the city area, going to Brooklyn and this kind of thing, that is that that would be like 40 miles or 50 miles anywhere else, simply because of the traffic, all the lights, et cetera. It's not like you know 11 miles in any kind of suburban area. It's 11 miles of the city, and you're trying to get through it all, and it's going to be a much longer journey. So that's why this journalist is bringing it up. And what is de Blasio's response? He just says, well, that's just part of the life of being the mayor. I'm from that neighborhood. I want to stay connected with it, etc." In other words, it's just what he wants to do for himself, and so therefore it's okay. I remember years ago when Al Gore came out with his film, An Inconvenient Truth, and then it was exposed that he uses many times more energy in his home and through his home, etc., than the average American, like, like way beyond. Uh, we, we see the same thing from a lot of these Hollywood personalities that come out, and they, they're talking about environmentalism and this kind of thing, and then you find out they've got their private jet, they're burning all kinds of jet fuel, which they say is terrible for the environment, but it's okay for them. They have their private yachts. They, in, in other words, it's okay for the elitist class to do these things, but not for the common people. Folks, this is nothing more or less than a return to the old monarchical thinking of the Dark Age, where there's one law for the nobility and for the elitists in the church, in both church and state, because that's how it worked. The, the priesthood of Rome, they were an elitist class, and then the monarchs that were uh, beside them were also an elitist class. And then you had the laws for the commoners, the common folk. Those laws did not apply to the elites. Now, that kind of thinking is entirely unbiblical. 
It's entirely unbiblical. And the Reformation changed it dramatically by going back to the Bible and declaring that with God there is no respect of persons. Uh, and we find in the Bible, both church and state, you find kings and rulers and so on being held accountable by God. You find in the temple, for example, Eli and his sons, Phineas and Hophni, they were held accountable by God for what they did. There's accountability. Uh, God does not accept this idea of an elitist class. In fact, it is often said, I think rightly so, that when Jesus is talking about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in the book of Revelation, that word Nicolaitan means literally rulership over the laity, and it has to do with having a religious order of, of priestcraft, if you will, that lords themselves, exalt themselves over the general population as though they are better than others. Uh, and this is, this is a problem throughout the history of the church, throughout the history of Western civilization. But it's everything that our forefathers fought against, and it's part of what is contained in the phrase that we have in our Constitution, all men are created equal, meaning that we have equal rights before God, and there's equal accountability. That's the idea. Uh, but with this Green New Deal, that's not the case at all. With the, uh, with the left, the radical left, they most definitely believe in a system of elitism where they have certain privileges that other people don't have. It's the whole idea, you know, when people talk about communism, they say, oh, yes, well, every, everyone is equal, but some people are more equal. And that's just how communism operates everywhere. All right, so let's move on from this to the association with Nazism. Now, there is an article, a review an article here um, on EncounterBooks.com, and the headline is How the Nazis Embraced Environmentalism. How the Nazis Embraced Environmentalism. And it's an excerpt from Rupert Darwall's Green Tyranny. An excerpt from Rupert Darwall's Green Tyranny, uh, written by Rupert Darwall. Um, but here I want to read a... Uh, part of a paragraph here, because this kind of captures the overall view of what's being communicated in this book. And here's what, here's what it says, quote, The Nazis' profound hostility to capitalism and their identification with nature politics led them to advocate green policies half a century before any other political party. As an approximation, Subtract Nazi race hate, militarism, and desire for world conquest, then add global warming and Nazi ideology ends up looking not dissimilar to today's environmental movement. From the vantage point of the second decade of the 21st century, it might come as a shock, but should not surprise that Hitler and the Nazis were the first to advocate large-scale renewable energy. Remember that, brethren. Hitler and the Nazis were the first to advocate large-scale renewable energy. All right, let's start talking about the Nazis and the Green New Deal and the history of environmentalism uh, going back to the Nazi movement. Right before the break, we were reading a quote from the book uh, Green Tyranny by Rupert Darwall. Green Tyranny. You can find the book on Amazon. Uh, it generally gets positive reviews, but of course, uh, a book like this is going to be very controversial because uh, in the schools and the colleges and so on, they're teaching all of this environmental propaganda and brainwashing. And uh, many of our young people, in fact, there was that uh, video clip that they had uh, some months ago with the young school kids, seven, eight, nine years old, uh, confronting Diane Feinstein, confronting Diane Feinstein and telling her she needed to do something quick to get the Green New Deal in because it's endangering all of us and this kind of thing. And these hysterics from uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez that we've got 12 years at teaching this to kids in the schools is very, very dangerous, especially when at least half the scientists who are out there 
are say that this whole global warming argument is a hoax, that it's simply not true, that uh, no, we're not experiencing global warming. Uh, the, the, the weather patterns and this kind of thing has always been the case for our planet. You can find them in the pages of history going back thousands of years. Uh, this is not uncommon in the history of mankind. No man is not causing global warming because we've developed technology, etc. That's simply not what's really happening. Even the founder of Greenpeace thinks that global warming is simply untrue, and he's spoken out against it repeatedly. In fact, here's a headline from the Daily Caller. It says, uh, quote, Greenpeace co-founder, climate crisis is not only fake news, it's fake science. And that's uh, co-founder Patrick Moore. Patrick Moore. The climate crisis is not only fake news, it's fake science. Now, that's pretty devastating. I mean, Greenpeace was the original environmental protection radical group. I mean, and, and I think that a lot of what they were doing, I actually knew when I was in college many years ago, uh, one of my roommates was part of the whole Greenpeace movement. Uh, he was older than I was, but uh, he was attending the university. We were at the University of the North Carolina School of the Arts. Anyway, uh, my impression was that Greenpeace began as a very sincere organization concerned about our environment uh, and pollution and polluting the waters and this kind of thing, which I think most all Americans would agree especially conservatives. Uh, conservatives are, are into hunting and they want to go fishing and they want to be out in nature. Then Nobody wants to go out in nature and see garbage all over a, a field or to see junk in our rivers and, and things like that. Nobody wants that. So we all agree in maintaining the environment in a reasonable manner. But what the radical left has done is they've latched onto this idea, taken it to an extreme, and now want to use it and are using it as a political weapon to gain more and more control over society. Now, here's a quote that I think is very important. This is from the article on the book Green Tyranny from the excerpt. And it opens by saying, quote, mankind's subservience to the commands of nature provides the connecting thread between Nazism and modern-day environmentalism and represents a radical rejection of the Enlightenment's belief in progress. It is what separates the new left and the modern left's softer variants from their predecessors. Now, I, I could just tell you from having studied some of the propaganda films that the Nazis used back during that time the the nazis and we we talk about some of this if any of you have seen our film negato to the new age we actually show some clips from nazi propaganda films because darwinism and the whole idea of natural selection and the laws of nature you see they don't believe the laws of nature as christianity has taught which is where the laws of nature coincide with and are in agreement with the laws of God in the Bible. And if we think something about nature, the way that we find confirmation for whatever we imagine to be true about nature is we look to the Holy Scripture. Because that is why God gave the Scripture for our instruction. Okay, to provide light for man whose heart, if you read Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, when it says, When men knew God, they glorified him not as God, but they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, thinking themselves to be wise, they became as fools, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So men at one point knew God, but then they fell into idolatry, which is basically what Paul is saying, if you read the whole thing. And as a result, their hearts, the light, whatever light God had put in their hearts, was darkened. Now, there's still elements there. In Romans chapter 2, Paul says that when the Gentiles, by nature, do that which is contained in the law of God, they show the law of God written on their hearts. So there's that evidence that God had given light to man. But because of sin, 
that light was darkened. So then God, through Israel, provides a written testimony, divine revelation, the Holy Scripture. This is what our forefathers believed. And this is what's bound up in the phrase in the Declaration of Independence, the laws of nature and of nature's God. That's what that means, laws of nature and the laws of God. But they're in agreement, one with the other. So if somebody has an interpretation of nature that contradicts the Bible, it's wrong. That's a result of the darkness of their heart. Um, so this used to be the, the, the classic standard teaching in the Christian world. That was the understanding. Man, because of sin, fell into error. God provided light through divine revelation, the Scripture, the Bible. And so that's the light by which men see. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But what happens once you get rid of the Bible, man falls into darkness. And this is exactly what happened with Darwinism and with Nazism, because now man begins to interpret nature for himself. And so from there, you know, in, in these Nazi uh, propaganda films, they would talk about the, the idea of the master race, the Aryan race, and how part of the law of nature was that you've got to protect the master race. And what do you do? Well, you get rid of the lower races. You get rid of people who are genetically deficient because they're bringing down the gene pool, as it were. And so the way that, uh, the, way that the Nazis saw how they should govern humanity is almost like uh, you know, pruning a tree if you've got bad leaves on the tree or something, you go and you, you cut them off, you get rid of them, and then that allows the rest of the tree to flourish. This is what they saw themselves doing through the Holocaust by rounding up Jews that they believed were subhuman and then others that they believed were subhuman and putting them to death because they were simply a hindrance to society. They were the useless eaters on the planet. And that's where all this environmental tyranny ends up. It ends up with uh, the declaration that nature, supposedly, is really more important than man. And you have to submit to the commands of nature. This is the idea. Natural selection. And if nature has chosen the Aryan to be the superior master race, well, then all others need to submit. That's, that's really what Nazism was all about. And that's why this environmental stuff, even though it sounds kooky, it's strange, it's even absurd and ridiculous, of course it is. But it's also very dangerous once it falls into the hands of these radical leftists who then gain power in government. And it's very disturbing that we see the Democratic Party once again, adopting virtually all of the policies of the Nazis from the 1930s and 40s. All right, brethren, we talk about Pope Francis calling for solidarity with Islam. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about the continued controversial influence of the Islamic Congresswoman Ilhan Omar and uh, other issues that are going on in the news right now where Islam is concerned in the Western world. But uh, to start it off, I mean, this is, it, it really should not be shocking to us, but every time I see it, you just wonder how this could be happening. Uh, and yet it is. Yet it is. Even, even though Islam as a belief system rejects the doctrine that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, something they're very, very adamant about, very, very dogmatic about the, the rejection of Jesus as the Son of God, declaring that God or Allah, their God, has no son, etc. And yet here we've got the Pope in Rome, Pope Francis, who professes to be the head of, I mean, well, if we go with the teaching of Roman Catholicism from antiquity, the Bishop of Rome is supposedly the universal bishop over all the Christian churches. So the Pope is supposed to be, based upon this ancient declaration from 606 AD, uh, he's supposed to be the representative of Christianity to the world. Now, of course, we as Protestant evangelicals 
Bible-believing Christians, we don't receive that. We reject the idea uh, that the Pope has that authority or that position. Nevertheless, uh, he's most certainly considered the uh, chief of the Roman Catholic Church and Catholics around the world. And yet here he's giving this speech here a short time ago. We're going to play part of the audio where the Pope is speaking. Of course, he's speaking in what sounds like uh, Spanish, and uh, Rome Reports is giving an English translation. So bear that in mind. Rome Reports in English, and I'm going to read from it while uh, Pope Francis is speaking. You'll hear him in the background. But he says, uh, however, some may wonder why the Pope is visiting Muslims and not just Catholics. What God wants, he says, is for there to be fraternity among us. This is why, in a special way, I made this trip. To be with our Muslim brothers and sisters, children of Abraham like us, he says. So the Pope says, why does God allow there to be many religions? He says, God wanted to allow it. God wanted to allow it, he says. And he goes on, he says, scholastic theologians say, or says, God's permissive will. He wanted to allow this reality. There are many religions that are born from culture, but they always look to heaven. They look to God. He says, we should not be afraid of difference. God has allowed it. However, we should be afraid if we do not work together with our brothers and sisters because we live together. So he continually refers to the Muslims as brothers and sisters and that God has allowed these differences and, and this sort of thing and we shouldn't be concerned about it. That's the approach. Now, of course, you compare that to the declaration of the Apostle Paul on Mars Hill in the book of Acts of the Apostles when he's testifying to the people of ancient Athens who worship the many pagan gods there. And he tells them that they were, as a people, very superstitious, that they had a misunderstanding about God. And Paul told them the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now he commands that all men everywhere repent because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. And he's given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. All right, and of course, you can find that in Acts chapter 17, uh, around verse 30, 30 through 31, where Paul says, the times of this ignorance God winked at, King James, overlooked, and we won't make too much of what that means about pre-Christianity. But nevertheless, uh, post-first century, there's no question, the gospel proclamation has been given to all the world. And whenever anybody brings up ecumenism, they want to talk about ecumenical dialogue or anything like that, the model that we have biblically, brethren, for ecumenical dialogue is Acts chapter 17, because that's what's going on. The Apostle Paul is there in ancient Athens. They've got all the pagan gods. Well, I don't know if they were all the pagan gods, but they've got a whole collection of them. It was said there were more pagan gods in the city of Athens, if I remember this correctly, than in all the rest of the cities combined, or something like that. But they just had a massive amount of pagan idols. That's the main point. A massive amount of pagan idols there. And at no point does the Apostle Paul say to the people, at no point does he communicate that, well, I'm here to tell you that your gods are all the same as my God. You know, they're, all gods are one and the same, and really we all believe the same thing. And the only thing that matters is that we don't fight and argue with each other. And so that way we won't have wars anymore. And that's the only thing that God wants. See, God doesn't, because really this is the message, if you think about it, brethren. People, people think, well, the only thing that God wants is for there not to be any violence anywhere with anybody. And whatever you can do to, to stop any sort of violent 
conflict that might happen, wars or conflicts or any, anything you can do to stop that, that's the only important thing. That's the impression that people have. So let's find ways to get along with Islam, even if it means adopting a false peace with Islam. Even if it means embracing things that are lies. That's the approach. And this is why it's so important to recognize that the Lord Jesus Christ said very clearly, do not think, think not, that I am come to send peace on the earth. I am come not to send peace, but a sword. And so thinking constantly, as many people do, and certainly we've seen this in the Christian community, that, oh, it just it doesn't matter, all these differences. Oh, what, the only thing that matters is that we're just all getting along and that nobody's mad at each other and nobody's fighting and arguing. And as long as everybody's just nice, then that's all that matters as though that's the message of Christ or the apostles. I mean, think about what Paul is witnessing to the Pharisees, and they are rejecting the gospel. And Paul finally shook out his garment and said, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. He walks off. He leaves them. Think about what Jesus said to the apostles. If they reject your testimony, you shake off the dust of your feet against them, and you move on. It'll be better for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that city. I mean, you think about the Lord in the temple, turning the tables upside down, making a whip. Think about it. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to make a whip, but that's what he does. He makes a whip, and he goes after him. I mean, biblical Christianity, New Testament Christianity, even, is, is radically different from what we're being told in the mainstream today. It's why I think uh, so many people, and I've been reading about this more and more online, there really are more and more people who are going back and researching the Puritans, researching uh, the reformers, they're, they're studying Christianity in centuries past because many people recognize we have lost something here in modern times. There's been this effeminization process that's gone on through the 20th century. And you think about what Jesus says, the, the parable of the tares and the wheat, where he says, while men slept, while men slept, an enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. You know, has Christianity gone to sleep? Did Christianity get comfortable in the 20th century, at least in the West? Certainly not in many other parts of the world. Christians have been persecuted in many other parts of the world, but in the West, by and large, in America and you know, in Europe for the most part, although Europe had two world wars. But has the church become too effeminized? I think many argue that it has. And here we've got the Pope really repeating the declarations of Vatican Council II, because Vatican Council II uh, made the same claim, that, that Muslims are like brothers and sisters, that supposedly we all worship the same God. But this is a very, very different declaration, even from what the Reformers taught. Uh, Martin Luther, if you read Luther's commentaries, on Muhammadism and Islam and so on, he, he, he says that the God of Islam, the God of Muhammad, is an obvious black devil. That's what he says. That, that if you just read the Quran, it's obvious that Muhammad was inspired by a devil. That was Luther's view. Uh, Calvin, on the other hand, referred to Muslims as cursed hellhounds. That's what he called them. Cursed hellhounds. There was no politically correct dialogue from these guys. I mean, not at all. Uh, now let's go. Now the Pope is telling the Muslims that they worship the same God of Abraham. Let's look at what Jesus said to the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and so on, where in verse uh, John chapter 8, verse 39, where we read, They answered and said unto him, unto Jesus, Abraham is our father. 
Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. All right, so this is what the Lord Jesus Christ said to the Jewish leaders who claimed that Abraham was their father and that God was their father. And he said, no, you're of your father, the devil. He says, if Abraham were your father, you'd do the works of Abraham, but you're not doing what Abraham did. Abraham believed God, believed the testimony that God had given, and God accounted it to him for righteousness, which is what we read elsewhere throughout the New Testament. That's why Abraham is seen as the father of faith. Jesus said, Abraham longed to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. He longed to see the day of the Messiah, the Son of God, who's proclaimed, brethren, in the Old Testament, Psalm chapter 2. That's why when Jesus is on trial in Mark chapter 14, the Pharisees say to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? meaning, are you the Son of God? And he answers him and he says, I am. But do the Muslims receive that testimony? No, they do not, most certainly. So how then could they be, how, how then could they be worshiping the God of Abraham? That's simply not the case. And the Bible tells us so. Okay, we're going to go to continue our conversation about, well, the Pope now declaring that God wants Muslims and Catholics in particular to join together and be unified. That, of course, a very dangerous combination, as we've talked about before, because Rome and Islam, the Vatican and Islam, you can find connections between them throughout the 20th century. Both of these are political powers that have, with the Armenian Genocide, with the Holocaust, with the Rwanda Genocide, with, uh, with the invasion, the Islamic invasion of the uh, Greek city of Smyrna, where hundreds of thousands of Christians were massacred over and over again in these examples and I think many others. Throughout the 20th century, both Rome and Islam have persecuted and mass murdered Christians over and over and over again. Christians and Jews who have been killed by Islam and by Romanism. Now, of course, notice I haven't said Catholics because I, I don't think that's entirely fair because there are many Catholics that would never have anything to do with that. But uh, where Rome is concerned, where the Jesuits are concerned, where the hidden powers in the Vatican, the rather dark and evil powers that have been warned about over and over again, certainly we find evidence. I mean, I often point people to the Rwanda genocide, 1994. And some people think, oh, World War II, yes, there were connections with the Vatican and this kind of thing. Uh, but then they think, well, maybe that's the end of it. No, let's go study the Rwanda genocide. Over 800,000 people, mass murdered reportedly at the instigation of Roman Catholic priests and nuns in Rwanda, for which Pope Francis gave an official apology to Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda, two years ago, in 2017. So, to have these two powers now joining together, I mean, it is, it's incredible. When you, when you start studying the Reformers and what they believed, that Rome in the West and Islam in the East represented the two horns of the beast of prophecy 
that they were both two different types of antichrist. I think it was Luther who said they were the two legs of the beast, meaning that he's referring to the legs from Daniel chapter 2, the statue of Nebuchadnezzar's dream foretelling the final world empire. And here we're watching, brethren. I mean, when you just go read the writings from the reformers and so on, and those who came before us, and that they're writing about this, they're talking about it, they're warning about it. They didn't just say that they thought the Pope was Antichrist. They said that. But they also included Islam in the conversation. And that goes for Luther, that goes for Calvin. That was the overwhelming, I mean, that was the accepted view which I think is very important for us to consider today as we're watching these events unfold. Because I believe it's the fulfillment of a co collective prophetic warnings that we've been given in the Holy Scripture. Now, I don't pretend to understand them perfectly. I'm not sure that any earthly man does. But I believe there is enough there that we've got to, to remember that sure word of prophecy that we're admonished to pay attention to as unto a light that shineth in the darkness. All right, now I wanted to talk about a couple of other things. Uh, one, here's a story from Paul Joseph Watson. Uh, Roger Scruton fired for accurately stating word Islamophobia was invented by the Muslim Brotherhood. Okay, author and philosopher Roger Scruton was fired from his position as an advisor to the UK government on housing after he accurately stated that Islamophobia was, quote, a propaganda word invented by the Muslim Brotherhood. And there's no question that this uh, word has been implemented as a form of uh, psychological warfare. It is a form of propaganda, and, and it's to set up a false crime, if you will, a false problem for which there has to be a solution. They're not just setting up Islamophobia for no reason. They want to set up Islamophobia because the solution to Islamophobia is to bring in the elements of Sharia law, and we've talked about that before. But they've been doing that in Canada, they're doing it across Western Europe, and they're trying to do it, the Democrats are trying to get it done uh, here in the United States. They've already tried back in 2015. Uh, H.R. 569, where they want to condemn any sort of hateful rhetoric or and ultimately any kind of criticism of Islam, which is the foundation of what Sharia does. It exalts Islam as the number one religion and punishes anybody who speaks against it. So that is apparently, at least from what we can see right now, that's how it works. They set up the false problem, then they come up with a solution. The solution is bring in these elements of Sharia law and pressure the government to pass legislation because the Muslims need to be protected from the Islamophobes. Okay, that's the idea. All right, now another issue uh, Ilhan Omar, here on the cover of Newsweek. Newsweek magazine, of course, all these left-wing publications are promoting her and, uh, you know, as, as these, you know, progressive champions for change and this kind of thing. But here's what it says. Here's what it says. This is on, uh, there's an article about this on Jihad Watch. And it says the headline is Newsweek features anti-Semitic rep Omar on its cover, quote, changing the conversation on Israel. Changing the conversation on Israel. Changing the conversation. Well, well, what is the conversation? Ben, I mean, up to now in America generally, even though sure you, you have people who are anti-Israel, there's no question. But the United States overwhelmingly has supported Israel and largely, I think, because of the evangelical community. And I've said before on this program, we have a long history as English speaking Christian people of supporting what God is doing with the nation of Israel and the Jewish people, because we do believe, as our ancestors did, going back to Oliver Cromwell and the Puritans, they believed there was a prophetic destiny 
for the children of Israel, meaning Israel after the flesh, as the Apostle Paul calls them. And while people debate exactly how that's going to unfold, what's going to happen, etc., the Puritans most definitely believed in the future salvation of the Jews and that they would return to their ancient homeland, that they would be restored to the promised land, which is what happened in 1948. And this is one of the primary reasons why I put a difference between the original Cal Reformed Calvinist Protestants and what today are your neo-Reformed Calvinist Protestants. That is something that we as believers should look out for because the Puritans believed that they should influence government in such a way to cooperate with God's prophetic plan in as much as is possible, in as much as possible to do so. And I think many Christians in America, Bible-believing Christians, evangelicals especially, generally believe the same thing. All right, brethren, we are out of time. We are going to talk about the burning of Notre Dame, the burning of Notre Dame, Notre Dame Cathedral. As many of you are well aware by now, because it's been all over the news, uh, Notre, the very, very famous uh, cathedral, Notre Dame, more than 800 years old, the uh, setting for the very famous story of the Hunchback of Notre Dame, which most everybody is familiar with, and uh, the bells, the big bell tower up there. And this has been a French Catholic cathedral for centuries. It's, it is one of the uh, great icons of France. And now has been burned somehow or other with this controversial fire. And there's all sorts of things that are happening surrounding this fire. A lot of strange things going on. And you kind of wonder how this fire got started. Some people have said that the fire was started deliberately. Other people are arguing that there is no evidence of that. Now, of course, it is not an illogical assertion to wonder about it because it has been reported that in 2018, some 875 French churches were vandalized in the year 2018, last year. 875 French churches were vandalized. And who's doing most of the vandalizing? The Muslims, the migrants that are there. It's, it's now being called uh, Muslim-occupied France. And you figure there's 365 days a year that is more than two churches a day that are being vandalized. And, pray, and maybe there are some that are being vandalized by someone other than Islamic militants and migrants and this kind of thing. That could very well be the case. But the, the reports seem to lean in the direction that the vast majority of the vandalization is happening because the Muslims are trashing uh, these historically Christian churches. Now, yes, of course, we understand that most of these churches are likely uh, Catholic churches. Nevertheless, on the world stage, it is a symbol for Christianity. Uh, some have pointed out that the last time the Notre Dame Cathedral was vandalized, or an earlier time that it was, was by French Calvinists who were radicals, uh, the Huguenots. And there, but I, I would point this out. They didn't go there to burn the church down. They went there to smash the idols, the graven images that were in the church. Now, why do they do that? Because they saw it as a building that was dedicated as a house of God, God within the context of the Christian faith. And they wanted to destroy the idols that had been set up in what was perceived in France to be a house of God. I think that's worth noting. But there are some very strange things that are going on in the media right now that are cause for concern, for paying attention to, I think definitely, because what we're seeing is a massive deflection campaign by the media, by Fox News in particular, which is, you know, they're, it's like they're going out of their way, the, the journalists, to deflect any attention from the possibility that this could have somehow or other been an Islamic 
terror attack against Notre Dame Cathedral. And whether or not that was the case, I honestly don't know. In fact, I, I think there, I think it's very possible that that's not the case, that something else could be in play here, something that has to do with globalism and ecumenism, which we're going to talk about on the program here in a minute. But what I want to point out is what has been going on over at Fox News. Now, over at Fox, we've, we've just seen what happened with Judge Janine. Judge Janine spoke out against the Islamic representative Ilhan Omar and speculated that her uh, Sharia sympathies may have had something to do with her perspective on Israel and the anti-Semitic comments that she's made that were very, very controversial. She made, she made those assertions on her program, and Fox, the executives at Fox, pulled her show for two weeks, and now she's back on, and I haven't really heard her saying you know, anything in follow-up to all of that. She seems to be avoiding the issue. Now that you have the burning of Notre Dame Cathedral, it's been shown that Shepard Smith over at Fox and uh, also Neil Cavuto. Shepard Smith and Neil Cavuto have both, when having conversations with people about the fires at the Notre Dame Cathedral, they had guests on their program who began to suggest that this was some kind of Islamic vandalism of churches. Why? Because hundreds and hundreds of churches in France have been vandalized by the Muslims. And in fact, you, you can go online, you, they've got uh, pictures, photographs outside the churches there. Uh, most people are looking in horror at the Notre Dame Cathedral up in flames and this kind of thing. And then you have Muslims in different photos or men who appear to be Muslims who are laughing and smiling and celebrating it. And it's been reported online that all of these uh, Muslims are celebrating the burning of the Mo Notre Dame Cathedral. All right, but I want to play these brief clips from uh, Fox News interviews while they were reporting on the the fires there. And the, the first interview... Uh, this is uh, between Philip Carcenti, who is a French elected official, and Shepard Smith over at Fox News. And listen here as uh, this French official begins to speculate in the direction where it sounds like possibly he's going to say that Muslims were responsible and Shepard Smith very hurriedly uh, shuts him down and gets him off the program quickly. Just listen. Of course, you will hear the story about the, the politically correct, the political correctness, which will tell you that it's probably an accident. Sir, but sir, sir, I, we're not going to speculate here of the cause of something which we don't know. If you have so observation, if you have observations yeah. or you know something, we would love to hear it. So I'm just telling you something. What we need to be ready. No, sir, we're not doing that here. Not now. Okay. Not on my watch. Okay, so that you can hear this French official, he says, uh, of course, you're going to hear the politically correct version of things, which, which, of course, in political correctness, you don't blame the Muslims, even though uh, they, they've vandalized over 800 churches in the, in the last year. So the politically correct thing to do is not to speculate that it could be Muslims uh, who are behind this. And uh, then the French official starts to say, well, you need to be ready for what? For learning that quite possibly this is another Islamic attack on churches in France. I mean, the, the Muslims are burning down churches all over the world, wherever they are. If there are ch in Nigeria, different parts of Africa, if there are churches somewhere, there is going to be sooner or later an Islamic uprising if there is a substantial Muslim population nearby. This is known. I mean, this is this has been happening for years. We continually point people to the website, thereligionofpeace.com. Go there, check out the Jihad Report on a daily or weekly or monthly basis, and you'll see uh, there are continued attacks every day. And many of those attacks, most of them are aimed at Christians and aimed at churches in particular. 
All right, now here's here's just another brief audio clip. Listen to Neil Cavuto. See, it's not just Shepard Smith. Listen to Neil Cavuto talking to uh, Bill Donahue with the Catholic League. Listen to this conversation very, very briefly. Here it is. I'm sorry. I mean, when I find out that the Eucharist is being destroyed and excrement is, is being smeared on crosses, Wait a minute. this no, is going I on now. Do, we can, we, no, I, I love you, Neil, but we cannot make conjectures about this, so thank you. Oh, I'm not, not, I'm, no, I'm sorry. Thank you very, very much. I do want to let people know, and again, we're not trying to be rude to our guests here. There is so much we do not know about what, what happened here. All right, so you hear that? Both times, these, these guests are cut off very quickly. And this comes in the aftermath of what went on with Judge Janine. It's like the word has been given out over at Fox News, nobody is to speak out against Islam or make any kind of negative commentary about Islam. And if they do, you cut them off. That's just not going to be tolerated over at Fox. Now, what's remarkable to me, you... you, you Listen, think about what they're saying. They're, they're sitting there saying, oh, uh, we just can't speculate over here. Are you kidding me? I mean, 95% of what they call news, whether it's at Fox or CNN or anywhere else, is nothing but endless speculation. They're speculating, well, are they going to indict Hillary this week? Well, you think she'll go to jail? Uh, what about Trump? Is there evidence of Russia collusion? Could the president be impeached? Uh, did the Trump administration cooperate with Russians to steal the election? And on and on and on. Endless speculation. you got to be kidding. That's what they do. That's 95% of what they do on a daily basis. But now suddenly, they can't speculate about how the fires might have gotten started over at Notre Dame. Can't say a word about it. They've just got to just cut people off very, very quickly. You see what's happening, brethren, and this is, this is where we, we have to pay attention to this very carefully because what's happening is now Fox, which in the mainstream, we've known that Fox is, they're like soft conservative socialism. They're, they're the speed bump to kind of slow things down while the Democrats and CNN are trying to rush us into a Marxist conclusion in our country. Uh, but nevertheless, Fox, it, it, as that speed bump, as the conservative resistance, if you will, in the mainstream, because it, it, many of us have known that that's not really the case. If Fox is, is a, it's not what it often appears to be. But now, Fox is being made to be Sharia compliant. That's what's happening. They're being made to be Sharia compliant. Because under Sharia, you don't say anything negative about Islam. You, you don't have any sort of negative commentary about Islam under Sharia. That's the foundation of it. This is what we've talked about. This is what the whole Islamophobia thing is about. The purpose of Islamophobia is to say Islamophobia is a problem. It endangers Muslims, supposedly. And as a result, laws need to be passed to condemn and forbid negative comments against Islam. Okay? And that's how they get it in. And they're doing this throughout the Western world. Canada, across the UK, across Europe. And here in America, the Democrats have tried to advance this, but what's very disturbing is to see this development over at Fox. Fox is becoming increasingly to the left. They're moving in that direction. And, you know, Murdoch, um, uh, Murdoch Sr., Rupert Murdoch, is, uh, has been a member of the pontifical order of uh, Gregory the Great knighted by the Pope. Uh, now, what would Rome's interest be? Because Judge Janine is Catholic, from what I understand. Many of the journalists over there are Catholic. And Bill Donahue with the Catholic League, of course, he is Catholic. Very, 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 very staunch, traditional Catholic. Um, but what's going on? Well, when we come back, we're going to go to our commercial break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the fact that while Notre Dame was the big story, a secondary story was that 
Now, supposedly, there was a fire also that was burning at the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound on the Temple Mount in Old Jerusalem. Talking about the burning of Notre Dame, the burning of Notre Dame, what could be behind this all? Well, the initial reaction from a lot of people is to speculate that this could have been some kind of Islamic vandalism, an Islamic attack on the Notre Dame Cathedral, and that could be the case. I haven't seen, at least so far, whether anybody has a conclusive argument in that direction or not. However, there are some who are noting that it is very interesting that just several days before this fire broke out, that sculptures of the Twelve Apostles and four New Testament evangelists were removed for restoration just days before the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris caught fire on Monday. And the New York Times has an article on this. The headline says, quote, A miracle of timing, the statues that escaped the Notre Dame fire. And then they go on to say sculptures of the Twelve Apostles, etc., as we said before. Okay, this is all from the New York Times article. But you can find this reported elsewhere as well. But isn't that an interesting bit of timing? And then there's also other relics, uh, Catholic relics that were rescued from the cathedral. And undoubtedly, when Notre Dame Cathedral is restored, when it's rebuilt, those things will likely be restored with it. And Macron, the French president, has said specifically that uh, we... What did he say? He said, we, let me get this exact quote here. Yes, French President Emmanuel Macron has said, quote, we will rebuild Notre Dame together. Think about that. We will rebuild. When he says we at this point, because remember, Macron has said that uh, immigration, the Islamic immigration into France is not going to stop, that that is the future of France. The future of France is to have more and more and more immigrants coming into that country, flooding the country, etc., with more and more Muslims. And now we are going to rebuild Notre Dame together. Okay, now with all that in mind, it's also being reported that there was a fire erupting at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. Now, with all of this, we just did a show here a short time ago on how the Pope is calling for solidarity, unification between Catholics and Muslims. He signed an agreement with a, 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 an Islamic imam, the Pope did, calling for this unification, calling for togetherness and all this other kind of stuff. Could there be more to this whole situation that meets the eye? I mean, people online are already speculating that the, the removal of these statues and things like this days before the fire broke out uh, could very well have been part of some greater plan. That's part of that's why I say, I mean, who knows uh, what went on, how these fires began. Uh, could it be that the whole thing was just an accident? Well, that could be the case. That is still a possibility. So I freely admit we are speculating here. But here is what I am going to speculate. You, you, you want an ecumenical conspiracy theory? I'm going to give you one. When they rebuild Notre Dame Cathedral, it is not going to surprise me if there are Islamic elements to the rebuilding of Notre Dame. If they are not going to blend Catholic iconography with Islamic iconography, that is not going to surprise me at all. Now, of course, we're going to have to wait and see. We're going to have to wait and see. But let's, let's review this story here. Let's go back here to February and to the Catholic publication Crux, Taking the Catholic Pulse, at cruxnow.com, they have a story there. Quote, U.S. Catholic officials welcome Catholic Muslim document signed by Pope. Pope Francis and Sheikh Ahmed Al-Tayeb, the article says, 
Grand Imam of Egypt's Al-Azhar Mosque and University signed documents during an interreligious meeting at the Founders Memorial in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emir Emirates. The Pope and Sheikh El Tayeb stepped into a theological debate on the will of God toward religions when they signed a document on human fraternity and improving Christian-Muslim relations. Now, of course, that whole idea of improving Christian-Muslim relations is a, it's a deception. It's a very, very clear deception. When you've got, you look at Georgetown University, remember the Pope is a Jesuit. The Jesuits, their whole Christian-Muslim relations, that is a one-way conversation and a one-way bridge whereby the Muslims are invited to invade the Christian world. That's what we have to remember. It's a one-way argument. Christians are bigots and they're racists and they are Islamophobes and they have xenophobia and all this other kind of stuff. And all the Christians just need to get over that and embrace Islam. I mean, that's the that's the conversation in a nutshell. Okay? Now, reading part of this document that they signed, here is part of what this document that the Pope signed with uh, the Muslim sheikh, here's what it said, quote, We who believe in God and in the final meeting with him and his judgment on the basis of our religious and moral responsibility, and through this document call upon ourselves upon the leaders of the world, as well as the architects of international policy and world economy, to work strenuously to spread the culture of tolerance and of living together in peace. Remember what the Apostle Paul said, When they shall say peace and safety, then shall destruction come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. While they're saying peace... Why? Because they're declaring a false peace. They're not declaring the peace of Jesus Christ, which comes through acknowledging that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, and to his name, at his name, every knee must bow, including the knee of every Muslim. They need to acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and that is what they don't want to do. So there really can't be some peace treaty with Islam. The Bible says, What communion has light with darkness? What concord has Christ with Belial? Meaning the devil. There is no peace treaty with the devil. No, the devil ultimately and his angels are all going to be cast into the lake of fire. There's no, we're not called to make peace with the powers of hell. Uh, in fact, the whole idea of embracing a false peace on behalf of God is condemned over and over again in the Old Testament and in the New. So this is a problem. And this is what we've talked about on our last program, uh, a reminder of what Jesus says. Jesus says, do not think I came to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. And we remember the reform teaching of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, that the first horseman represents the power of God going forth with the gospel. But then the last three horsemen, war, and then famine, and then death, with hell following behind, those are the consequences of those who reject the gospel of Christ, that war comes, not peace. And then there's calamity, and then there's death and hell for those who reject the authority of Jesus as the Son of God, as the King of kings and Lord of all. All right, brethren, we are out of time. That is going to do it for us today. That is our show. We'll stop it there. Of Oliver Cromwell. That's where Cromwell went to school. He was raised up as a boy. And there they have the Cromwell Museum. And we had the pleasure of interviewing uh, a Mr. Stuart Orme, who is the curator of the Cromwell Museum there in Huntington. A wonderful guy, very, very knowledgeable about all things Oliver Cromwell. And they have there at the Cromwell Museum the largest collection of historic artifacts pertaining to 
the Lord Protector of England, as he was called. And they even have his death mask there that was pretty powerful. Death masks, of course, used to be very, very common. You find them throughout history. Uh, we have here in America, we have George Washington's death mask, for example. There are many others. Well, they have one for Oliver Cromwell there at the museum. And of course, we got a lot of great footage there, which we will show you. The Magna Carta Monument as well. Many people are not aware that the monument there in England was actually dedicated by the American Bar Association back in the 20th century as a, uh, as a memorial to honor the, what it, what they, on the monument it says, uh, to honor the history of freedom under law. Freedom under law. The recognition that without law, you can't have freedom. And mainly, it was law, Magna Carta was law to restrain the powers of government more than the power, you know, more than the people, more than the common people. It was about restraining the power of the king, making sure the king could not abuse his authority. That's why Magna Carta is so significant. But we saw the Magna Carta monument that morning, and uh, it was very powerful. It was uh, you know, just, just great historic significance. It's part of the foundation of what I'm calling and what I think others would call the progress of freedom in the Western world. The whole concept of freedom and liberty is really built around Christianity and the Bible historically, which is what we're going to show in our upcoming film, The True Christian History of America, which is why we went over there. We wanted to gather this final footage We've, we've got, you know, primary interviews that have already been done. We've got a lot of reenactments that have already been filmed. We've got footage in Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia and other parts of the country that we've taken. We've been gathering for several years now. And now this was the final push for this documentary to make sure that we get, you know, we're able to trace this history going back to England and parts of Europe, there's really a fascinating journey that this film is going to take the viewer on. And it's a view of the Christian history of America and the, the origin of things like freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom of the press and, and the freedoms that we take for granted. Where did they begin? How did they begin? And I had some, some really fascinating conversations with people like Stuart Orme. Then what we did that day on Monday, the 13th, after we left Huntington, we drove to Lutterworth. Lutterworth, which uh, was the town where John Wycliffe, back in the 14th century, where he uh, served as the vicar at the Lutterworth Parish Church. Okay, the Lutterworth Church there, and that's also where he passed away, where he died in 1384. And I had an opportunity while I was there to interview the chief pastor, the the vicar, as he is called at the church, who held who today holds the same position that John Wycliffe had back in the 14th century. And I had an opportunity to interview him. He had some very powerful things to say on camera about why Wycliffe translated his Bible, why he believed it was so important because you, and, and he talks about the, 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 the chokehold that the Roman priesthood had upon the people at that time, that the people were not allowed to read the scripture. And that, uh, so as a result, the only thing they knew about God and Christianity was what they were told by the priest. And he said, without any prompting from me, he said the reason they had outlawed the Bible, the reason they didn't want anybody to read it was because they did not want anyone to be able to hold the powers of government, uh, whether in the church or in the state, accountable for wrongdoing. And so they wanted to keep them in ignorance. And he said that's why Wycliffe believed it was so vital that the scripture be translated into the language of the common people. And of course, I'm paraphrasing what he said 
we're going to show you in our film exactly what he said uh, when the film is finished. But, uh, but it was a great, great conversation that I had with the, um, with, with the chief minister there in Lutterworth. And the town of Lutterworth, if you ever get an opportunity to go to England, I would highly recommend taking a trip to Lutterworth. What a wonderful, wonderful town. Great people there. They were the people at the church, at the uh, Lutterworth Church there, that are, are today the caretakers of uh, uh, Wycliffe's memory and uh, that, that church. What nice people, wonderful people that were there. And they were very charitable, very kind to us. They knew we were Americans and we'd come over there and uh, we were working on the documentary and whatnot. But they were very, very nice people. That's a place I would love to go back to, I have to say. All right, so then we left Lutterworth the next day. We spent the night there because it was that was a long day. Magna Carta, Cromwell Museum, and then the drive to Lutterworth. Uh, and then the next day on Tuesday, that's when we got up and actually did the, the filming at Lutterworth Church. Got some great footage there. Talked to the uh, senior pastor. Then when we left Lutterworth, we drove to Bath, England, several hours away, uh, down uh, on the southern part, su southwest, I think it was. But Bath, England, so named, Bath is named uh, because of the Roman baths. The city of Bath goes back to ancient Roman times, and they still have the Roman baths, some of them, still there. And when you're there, you can tell you're surrounded by all of this ancient architecture. It's really quite spectacular. And the city is just beautiful. But the reason we were there was to interview Dr. Alan Marshall at Bath Spa University. And he is a historian and he has written and taught about Oliver Cromwell and his influence historically. And so we went there to interview him and we were talking to both him and Stuart Orme about Cromwell and the English Civil War and what was going on and the influence of the Puritans and so on, and got some great interview footage from both of those uh, gentlemen. So it was a great, uh, great experience talking to them. Then Wednesday, we left England and flew to the Czech Republic, and we went to Prague, which uh, has holds the memory of Jan Hus, Jan Hus or John Hus, who uh, came after Wycliffe. Wycliffe passes away in the 14th century. Then Jan Hus is sometimes called Wycliffe's bulldog. And of course, we talk about him in A Lamp in the Dark, but now we talk about him from a different perspective because what happened to Hus was he was burned at the stake by the Council of Constance. He had been preaching the gospel. He had been preaching many of the things that Wycliffe had taught, speaking out against corruption in both church and state and so on, and that uh, these powers need to repent, turn to God, and then you know, preaching against the elitism of the Roman priesthood, which at that time was teaching that only the priests in the communion could partake of both the bread and the cup in communion but that the common people could only take the bread, but not the cup. That was the big, it was a big argument back then. And so, and why? Well, because they were, they were practicing a form of Nicolaitan doctrine. The idea of rulership over the laity, we're better than you. So we get the bread and the cup and you don't, you just get the bread. That was the argument. So this was one of the things that Hus uh, spoke out against and so when he gets to the Council of Constance, they condemned him as a heretic. He was tricked into going. He was guaranteed safe passage by the Holy Roman Emperor. But when he got there, they condemned him outright and then said they were going to have him burned at the stake. And his followers, who were called Hussites, saw this as a betrayal. And after Hus was put to death, there was this uproar and the people were outraged and so the holy roman emperor then decided to crack down and to invade that territory which at the time was called bohemia 
And so then this is when you have the one-eyed commander, John Ziska, who was a soldier, and he had apparently, uh, when, when we were at the Czech Republic, we did some filming there in Prague because they've got the, uh, the Jan Hus monument there in the, the big square. And so we went there, and then we drove south about an hour, a little over an hour, to the city of Tabor, and Tabor, the name is taken from the Bible, from the Old Testament, but it is actually the city where many of Hus's followers, they established the, the town, uh, the city of Tabor later on because they wanted to try and live according to the teachings that Hus had given them. And so that's why Tabor was, uh, was formed. But anyway, there they have the Hussite Museum and they have the memory of Jan Hus there. They have the memory of Ziska. A lot of attention paid to Ziska and the Hussite Wars, which are really, really a fascinating part of history. But ultimately, one of the things that they were fighting for, which is so significant, was the free preaching of the gospel. And under Ziska's command, Ziska apparently had been a thug. This is something that I did not know until I went to the museum and had a chance to interview uh, Professor Zdenek Zalud, Zdenek Zalud, who we, we got an interview with on camera. He is one of the experts there at the museum on Ziska and Jan Hus and so on. But anyway, he said Ziska began, he was a robber. He was like a highway bandit. And he was apparently converted by the preaching of John Hus and became a believer in Christ. And so when the Hussite Wars happened, he took command and led this band of farmers to victory some 16 times against the Holy Roman Emperor. But one of the things that they were fighting for that they were very clear about was the free preaching of the gospel because they believed that Hus had been betrayed and murdered why? Because he was preaching the gospel. All right, our trip here, uh, filming over in the UK and Europe. I'm going to read you this quote from J.A. Wiley, and then we're going to talk about the situation. Well, I wanted to kind of round it up with our, our going into Geneva. We went to Geneva to see the Reformation Wall there, and then to see the International Museum of the Reformation, which they also have in Geneva which gives a history of the Re Reformation. It's a great museum, the first half of it. And we'll talk about the second half, why it's not such a great museum. But uh, anyway, uh, let's go to this quote on the Hussite Wars, why the Hussite Wars are so significant, because they were inspired in no small part by the teaching of John Wycliffe. And we're going to be learning a lot about Wycliffe and his influence on the founding of America. Many people don't realize how uh, Wycliffe's translation of the Bible into English, into Middle English, admittedly, but it spread all over England and parts of Europe for the next hundred years before Martin Luther shows up, before Erasmus puts together the foundation of the received text and then you have luther uh, he produces a german bible from that and then william tyndale produces an english bible from that the tyndale new testament and so on which begins the the process now of uh, uh de translation development that leads all the way up to the geneva bible then the authorized version of 1611 but anyway uh, but wycliffe is really the one who's credited with laying the foundation for the Reformation that would happen later on. Uh, but so Jan Hus now is preaching the teachings of Wycliffe. He's burned at the stake. They silenced him. And then you have the Hussite Wars breaking out as a result. And here's what Wiley says about the Hussite Wars. He says, quote, and this is in his, uh, his history of Protestantism from the 19th century. He said, quote, the Hussites present the first instance in history of a nation voluntarily associating in a holy bond to maintain the right 
to worship God according to the dictates of conscience. True, they maintained that right with a sword, but for this they were not to blame. The invasion of their country by the armies of the emperor left them no alternative but to arms. End quote. So, uh, that is Wiley's analysis of the Hussites. Here you have men who were Christian men. I mean, these were men who took communion out on the field before they went into battle. They had the chalice, the cup of Christ, painted on their shields. They went into battle as Christian warriors, fighting for the gospel, their right to believe the gospel, their right to obey the commandments of God, and uh, to not have someone force them to believe things that they didn't believe. So that's what, uh, that is what Wiley is talking about where the Hussites are concerned. I think it's a fascinating chapter in the history, in church history. And it's part of the progress of this struggle for liberty. But I think it's so important that we reclaim as Christians today the understanding that the purpose of liberty was always from a Christian perspective, the fight for liberty. And our forefathers saw Christianity as the religion of liberty, and that without Christianity, you're not going to have real freedom, because all the variant pagan, pagan belief systems all represent various forms of bondage in one way or another, and they all practice slavery. So uh, that's another thing that has been lost. All right, let's talk about the... All right, so, so we interview Dr. Alan Marshall when we go to Bath, England. Then we go to the Czech Republic. We went to the Hussite Museum. Then we are in Prague. We go to the Hussite Museum, etc. So we finished out the trip in Geneva, Switzerland. We went to the Reformation Wall, which is located in a park there in Geneva, Beautiful, beautiful monument. For me, probably the most powerful historic monument that I've ever seen. Just really, and, and you can see pictures of it online. I certainly saw pictures of it online, saw some video clips online. I really don't think anything that I saw online did justice to it because they're telling a story through the monument. And they begin with uh, Wycliffe and Huss and Luther and a number of other figures. Then they go to Admiral Colony, Colony, who was uh, the leader of the Huguenots. He's the famed leader of the Huguenots, who was a great defender of the liberty and the rights of the Huguenots. Of course, he was tragically killed during the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre that occurred centuries ago. Uh, but he's still seen as one of the great champions of Christianity and Protestantism in particular. And the, the monument progresses through Calvin and the reformers there in Geneva. Of course, they've got, you know, the main platform, it being Geneva, of course. Uh, then they go to Oliver Cromwell and the period of the English Civil War. And then right in that area, but somewhere between Calvin and Cromwell, they have the Mayflower Compact. And they have the wording of the Mayflower Compact uh, etched there in stone, in the name of God, amen. And then it goes on to give you the Mayflower Compact because they saw and they recognized that the arrival of the pilgrims in America and the establishment of the Mayflower Compact, all of this was the direct continuation of what began with the Great Reformation. The founding of America was the result of this progress of Christian liberty and carrying the gospel to other parts of the world. And this is one of the reasons why I think uh, Samuel Adams, when he signed the Declaration of Independence, said, I trust from this day forward the reign of political Protestantism shall commence. I think that's why he says that. Because he saw the establishment of America 
And in his view, the United States. Now, I don't say they, that everyone saw it that way. I think there were those, certainly, who saw it differently. There's no question about that. But I think from Sam Adams' perspective, he saw it as the continuation of the great struggle of Protestantism over the centuries. But the Reformation Wall was very worthwhile, in my opinion. I thought it was very powerful, the story that they tell through the monument. Then we go to the International Museum of the Reformation. A lot of great artifacts and historic elements there. A lot of figures from the Reformation that are little known, you know, that, that, that most people don't remember. I mean, a number of people that I had never even heard of. Uh, you have, of course, you've got Calvin. Calvin is, John Calvin is undoubtedly featured the most prominently there in the museum because, of course, you're in Geneva. Uh, but then Martin Luther is also uh, well represented. Uh, then Heinrich Bullinger, of course, um, Theodore Beza. Theodore Beza, of course, and you know, we talk about Beza because. It was uh, Beza's fifth edition Greek New Testament that was used by the King James translators uh, on the authorized version. And of course, the authorized version was preceded by the Geneva Bible. We talk about all of that in A Lamp in the Dark, but now we're going to talk about Geneva and the influence of Calvin and the Calvinists in our next film, really more from a political perspective and how they influenced uh, government in terms of restraining tyranny and oppression and holding government accountable to the laws of God. But all of that is coming up in our next film.